Hey guys, hope you're having a great day so far. Today I wanted to put together a compilation of all of the Starkiller lore that we've covered so far on the channel. There's going to be a ton more Starkiller videos in the pipeline, as I just recorded one yesterday. However, I wanted a place where you could check out all of the old Starkiller lore if you're as interested in this massively powerful character as I am. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this lore video as you either cook, study, or just relax. So without further ado, let us begin. Force Unleash 2, Starkiller ventures to the world of Dagobah in search for answers. Answers on whether or not he is in fact the original Galen Merrick, or a clone as Darth Vader claims that he is. Starkiller believes that within the dark side Nexus cave on Dagobah will be his answers, and the truth will finally be revealed to him just as Luke Skywalker was granted a vision inside the same cave, with the vision imparted upon the young Skywalker boy being that if he went down the dark path, he would become just as his father is, twisted and evil by the dark side. But when Starkiller ventured to the world of Dagobah, he discovered something else. A little green creature. A little green creature that we know as Grandmaster Yoda. We know that Yoda selected Dagobah for his exile following the Jedi Purge because of its insanely strong dark side signature. The world of Dagobah is what is referred to simply as a dark side nexus. It's also a location with a ton of teeming life, as well as dense swampy jungles, meaning that ship scanners do not work very well there at all. Yoda selected this planet however, because of its dark side signature, knowing himself that his own place in the force was extremely bright and warm. But because of this warmth, his light and signature would be extremely easy to locate. Therefore, Yoda needed to conceal himself. At first, Starkiller senses nothing special about the green creature sitting before him right beside the cave, choosing to walk past him. In the cave, though, Starkiller is granted a vision that shakes him to his very being, in confirmation that he is not the original and that he is in fact a clone of Galen Merrick. Not to mention, despite turning to the dark side himself previously and having been trained directly by Darth Vader, the potent energy of the darkness that the cave produces shakes Starkiller to his very core, and he has an exceptionally difficult time remaining within the cave. Exiting the cave, he has a bright realization as he is utterly shocked that this creature could simply sit by the cave and feel nothing. But the dark side, despite being so potent and so raw, that this creature was able to resist it, so much so that it did not appear even as an annoyance to him. In the novelization for The Force Unleashed 2, we learn that Starkiller internally comes to one of two options. Starkiller's first theory about the green creature is that he's completely insane and also wields a power in the dark side that potentially Vader and his own master Insidious does not possess, and that the powers of the darkness have driven this creature to insanity, causing him to almost seek out the cave's very presence, locating a world such as Dagobah, and deciding never to depart simply because of the Nexus, belonging completely at home there. Starkiller believes that the being that we know as Yoda feeds off of the power of the cave as a sort of sustenance. The second option, though, is perhaps slightly more profound. Starkiller believes that the creature is not dark side in origin, but theorizes that the creature is so powerful that the effects of the cave mean absolutely nothing to it, and that he is so experienced and so powerful with whatever version of the force that he wields that he can sit by the cave and feel nothing. Both of these options, though, chill Starkiller to his very core, as his own experience in the cave was quite traumatic. In a very rare moment for a character like Galen Merrick, he is overcome with fear. It's important to note that this is not an emotion that Galen Merrick feels very often. Starkiller actively faces down Darth Vader, and the original Galen Merrick even stared down Darth Sidious in his immense power. But what chills Starkiller to his core is not the fact that he can sense the great power that this creature has, but that he cannot. Starkiller did not detect immediately that Yoda was force sensitive, which again adds a greater idea to why Dagobah was the perfect location for Yoda to hide out. I I theorized that Yoda even potentially sensed Starkiller coming to the world of Dagobah and sensing that he may be partially aligned to the dark side, opting to sit by the cave as a sort of concealment, sitting as close to the dark side nexus as powerful in an effort to shield his own presence in the Force, believing that perhaps Vader's apprentice or an Inquisitor of sorts had located him. In the end though, Starkiller does something exceptionally rare. 
and that is run. Darkiller runs to his ship on Dagobah and departs the planet as quickly as possible, not desiring to meet the green creature again. I feel like this little portion in the Force Unleashed novel goes a long way to explain just how terrifying it would be to meet Yoda, not realizing who or what he is. For all Starkiller knows, he's this creature that's exceptionally strong in the Force in the most powerful dark side nexus that he has ever faced. Not to mention, Starkiller doesn't actually sense that he has a presence in the Force at all, simply that he's undeterred by the energy swirling around within the cave, a cave that just granted him a vision that he will never forget, and it will haunt his nightmares forever. I also love the idea of the second explanation, that Yoda is so grounded in the light side of the Force as a 900 year old Jedi, simply sitting next to this dark side nexus leaves him completely unaffected. For nearly 20 years, the Empire was unable to sense or find Yoda on Dagobah, with this being one of the times when they were closest and they weren't even looking for him. Starkiller just came across the little green creature by happening stance. We also have to remember that Starkiller was stated to have the potential to become as powerful as Darth Sidious was, if he attained the same training. So for Starkiller to be afraid of something, an emotion that he likely never felt before, is insane. He's also been surrounded from the moment that he was conscious with beings that had fully embraced the dark side, and lets the power flow through them willingly. So when he encountered a being that was not affected by it in the slightest, he could not conceive this. He has no idea how to react to this creature and decides to run. But this is why Starkiller ultimately ran from Yoda during the events of the Force Unleashed 2, and why he did not wish to encounter the little green creature ever again. But now I turn it over to you, acolytes and students of the Force. What are your thoughts on Yoda's massive Force signature? His ability to face down the dark side of the Force in all of its forms and ability to stave off the effects of the Cave of Dagobah. If you were Starkiller and had little knowledge of this as well, would you also decide to run? As Galen Merrick, Starkiller, perhaps requires no introduction to the Star Wars fanbase. He is one of the most physically impressive lightsaber combatants in all of Star Wars lore, legends and canon included, able to contend with some of the most formidable of his lifetime known formally as Starkiller, and the secret apprentice to Lord Vader, Galen Merrick has grown into one of the most powerful lightsaber wielders in the entire galaxy. But what made Galen Merrick Starkiller such a gifted swordsman? What styles of lightsaber combat does Starkiller show a preference towards? And what made him such a formidable fighter, especially against the likes of Darth Vader? Today, we will be answering that question. Let's dive into why Starkiller is so dangerous, and the lightsaber combat styles that he seems to show a preference towards, and let's deduce the exact style of lightsaber combat, the form that he uses, and why. For this video, we will be breaking down his style into two parts, as he seems to change his methodology between games after he is eventually cloned in The Force Unleashed 2. As we have surmised that Galen, and Starkiller, the clone that is, use different forms and variations of combat, However, they are similar. Therefore, we will be starting with the first game and Galen Merrick, before exploring the progression of his style and how it evolved and is carried into the second iteration. First though, according to our analytics, a lot of you guys that watch the channel haven't actually subscribed yet, so if you want to stay up to date with everything Star Wars lore related, deep, and canon, force crush that subscribe button. During the events of the first Force Unleashed game, Galen Merrick had been seen using Juya, otherwise known as Form 7, which is one of the most erratic and unpredictable of lightsaber combat styles that are known. In fact, it was even forbidden among the Jedi. Commonly used by the likes of Darth Maul, Form 7 is a particular favorite of various Sith Lords due to its violent nature, as they use the dark side of the Force to bolster their output. It is far easier to channel dark side energy into Form 7 more than any other style, as it doesn't rely on the composure of a wielder. Instead, it allows a user to be unpredictable and violent, giving it an inherent sense of brutality and unpredictability, as no variations and styles of Form 7 are ever the same. He was interestingly able to pair this with Form 5 variation known as Xi'an, which is marked as the iconic backhanded style grip only seen on a few occasions in Star Wars. Though this style is not particularly popular in the modern Star Wars era, there are multiple notable practitioners of the reverse-handed grip including perhaps most famously Ahsoka Tano, 
who was taught the ways of Xi'an by her former master, Anakin Skywalker. Interesting, as both apprentices of Anakin and Lord Vader respectively adopted the style, as again, both Ahsoka and Starkiller were taught by the same master, and it's highly likely that Vader taught Starkiller this style in the same way that he had taught Ahsoka all those years ago, as he himself was an avid practitioner of Form 5, both Anakin as well as Vader, though Vader and Anakin respectively preferred the Dejem So variant over the Xi'an style, Jem So, which was far more aggressive, but still had the backbone of Xi'an. How this benefited Starkiller, though, was it allowed him to pair a blend of a violent style with a relatively unorthodox blade use, making his moves even more unpredictable and much more difficult to follow, which impaired the defense of any of his enemies. This allowed Galen Merrick to get an upper hand quickly by using a method that was difficult for his enemies to adapt to, and this granted him early victories on numerous occasions against very skilled swordsmen. For the duration of the first game, this seems to be the preferred style of Galen Merrick, meshing his aggression and untamed violence with a unique and disorienting style in order to take opponents off guard long enough for him to take the upper hand. Even taking on and defeating opponents such as Shock T, who was a noted swordsman herself and council member, as well as defeating Darth Vader himself. It's also important to note that the pairing of Form 5 and Form 7 was quite a rare one however, not unseen. While this style was incredibly efficient and brutal, his post-cloning form was a lightsaber of combat to be slightly different from this ideal of Galen Merrick. And one might argue that his style choices in the second game and the clone are far more effective, but more on that in just a moment. After his cloning, Galen Merrick, now Starkiller, takes on the same Xi'an style of lightsaber combat, but instead of pairing it with the Juya style, he instead adopts the much more refined style of Nyman. Form 6. Nyman, otherwise known as Form 6 lightsaber combat, was the culmination of the five styles that came before it, and this method is widely regarded as the most well-rounded lightsaber form. It took the styles before it and combined the strongest aspects of each form into one cohesive style of lightsaber combat, which allowed Jedi Knights to hold their own against a wide variety of different opponents. Widely known as the Jack of All Trades style, Masters of Nyman were not masters of any specific specific lightsaber form, but they contributed the strengths of each style into their combat encounters and could adapt rapidly based on any circumstance. This made Nyman Masters some of the most adaptable lightsaber combatants known to the Star Wars lore, and they could quickly change their forms and approaches on the fly with any given situation selecting which approach was the most effective in seconds. Perhaps one of the most famous users of this form was Syndralic, one of the preeminent lightsaber combatant instructors in the Jedi Order, as Syndralic was gifted the title of the Jedi Battlemaster at the time. Concerning Starkiller though, it was Form 6 paired with the same Xi'an grip styles which helped Starkiller have a much more rounded approach to lightsaber combat, even superior than what Form 7 had attributed to him in the past. It had been said that Form 7 is one of the most physically demanding lightsaber styles and is one of the most taxing methods of lightsaber combat that a Jedi or a Sith could adopt. This meant that Form 7 didn't have a particularly impressive longevity and it was meant to be used in short bursts of brute force to end a fight quickly. What's interesting about Starkiller though, it, it appears as if he also uses parts of Form 4 Ataru which is the second most physically demanding lightsaber style. This has a lot to do with his acrobatics, so to break it down very quickly, we believe that the first Starkiller, the original, used form variations such as Xi'an, Juya, Form 7, and Form 4. However, we believe the second iteration of Starkiller used pieces of Form 6, especially because this Starkiller most notably used two lightsabers, known as the Jarkai Dual Blade Fencing, a variation of Form 6. What should be noted though, is that to some degree, it appears as if Starkiller the clone is proficient in all seven forms of lightsaber combat, as he melds the likes of Xi'an into Jarkai Dual Blade Fencing as well as has the ferocity of a Form 7 and the acrobatics of a Form 4. But why do we believe that Starkiller was actually a better lightsaber duelist than Galen Merrick? Previously, the use of Strictly Form 7 meant that he was already a ferocious fighter, and he was able to overpower his opponents quickly. It meant that his violence and brutality could easily win fights in a short period of time, 
but he lacked the composure or defensive capabilities to carry a fight on longer for a prolonged period of time, and he had to build his stamina in order to utilize Form 7 effectively. However, Starkiller, after having mastered the agility that he needed, was able to reallocate his stamina into a use of Form 4, which was a much more controlled method of overpowering an opponent that didn't entail losing his composure or channeling the dark side tendencies. We also believe that this is because the Starkiller clone actually relies far more on the light side of the force than the original Galen Merrick did, which is why perhaps the Starkiller clone would have a much more difficult time tapping into Form 7 than the original Galen. What is most intriguing about Starkiller is he was not a master of any single form. He was adept enough to become a powerhouse of combat with multiple forms, marrying them each together simultaneously and this is what allowed him to grow into one of the most dangerous fighters of his generation. It's perhaps even likely that Starkiller did not know the fundamentals of each form and simply picked the style that worked best for him. As again, Starkiller was trained as a weapon and not a true apprentice. In our breakdowns of lightsaber combatants though, you will definitely find Galen Merrick and Starkiller among the most unique of them all. As the original Starkiller used a combination in a hybrid of Form 5 Xi'en and Form 7 Juyo. While the second iteration of Starkiller still used the foundation of Xi'en, the acrobatics yet composure of Ataru, and the versatility of Nyman. But although it appears to me that some of the Force Unleashed games appear to have fallen out of favor with Star Wars fans, I'm still highly nostalgic for them and a lot of the lore that they did, especially filling in that time period just before the events of A New Hope, detailing specifically Darth Vader and his plan to overthrow Darth Sidious through this inherently massively powerful character, that character of course being Galen Merrick, Starkiller. I grew up with the Force Unleashed games, specifically playing a lot the Force Unleashed 2, and within the Force Unleashed 2, there are small nuggets of Star Wars lore that I find absolutely fascinating about the character of Starkiller and Galen Merrick overall, especially after the original Galen Merrick's death at the end of the first game. So today, I want to break down and explore a facet of lore in The Force Unleashed 2, and a failed Starkiller Galen Merrick clone that Darth Vader attempted to develop, a clone known as the Maul Killer. So without further ado, students of The Force, if you too are a fan of Galen Merrick and The Force Unleashed 2, sit back as we open up this brand new holocron. It was always Darth Vader's original intention to use Galen Merrick to overthrow Darth Sidious, and had Darth Sidious not become aware of Galen Merrick and his innate incredible ability to use the dark side of the force in such a destructive manner, Darth Vader likely would have triumphed over his master, making Galen Starkiller an official Sith apprentice. However, in the end, this would not come to pass, as not only did Darth Sidious discover Galen, but he was also swayed toward the ways of the light side of the force. However, a generational skill such as Galen Merrick could not be overlooked by Darth Vader. Darth Vader was convinced that Galen Merrick would finally be his key to overthrowing his master. As Vader knew, as powerful as he was, he would never be able to mount something powerful enough to overthrow Sidious. So, even after Galen Merrick's death, Darth Vader resolved to clone him and use this incredible force potential to destroy Sidious. However, Darth Vader believed for a period of time that Galen Merrick could be improved upon. Darth Vader, although he had never directly met him, had sensed Darth Maul before, Darth Maul being the original apprentice to Darth Sidious directly. Darth Maul was a fearsome Sith assassin but beyond anything else, he was loyal to Sidious. This is something that Darth Vader highly desired and wanted to bend into his new clone. Along with this, he knew that Darth Maul's Zabrak species, or Nightbrother species, had a specific alignment to the dark side of the Force, with this being the reason that many of Maul's species are born with the glowing yellow Sith eyes. Darth Maul believed that if he could clone Darth Maul, as well as Starkiller into a singular being, then he would be more inclined to strictly adhere to the dark side, and he would not come across the same pitfalls of Galen Merrick, and Galen Merrick choosing to embrace the light side of the Force and the Jedi. To Vader at the time, he believed nothing could go wrong. Thinking back to the clone troopers that Vader had fought beside, his mind drifted off to Kamino, and he ventured there nearly immediately, with strict orders that the Emperor never discover this, with the plan 
to clone Galen Merrick. Unfortunately for Vader though, many of the clones of Galen Merrick that they originally produced were an utter disaster and resulted in monstrosities. From the Force Unleashed 2 databank, it says this, quote, aberrant clones, leading cloning technicians log to Mira City cloning facility. Another complete failure. While the subject's base genetic code remains intact, the physical expressions have been unsettling. The contents of the last tank were drained emitted a piercing howl despite a total lack of any visible mouth. If only we could look closer at the original genetic subject. Many of these clones were born with disabilities and with intense pain. Beyond this, Darth Vader then faced another problem with the clones as they began attacking and attempting to kill any subject that came close to them. What made things worse is they did actually possess some ability to touch the force. However, their physical bodies were extremely extremely fragile. Eventually, there were clones that were born that Darth Vader deemed acceptable, or at least that he would attempt to train. However, he did not have sufficient time, and it had taken the original Galen Merrick over a decade to hone his skill. Because of this, Darth Vader utilized what is known as memory flashes, flashes of training sessions from the original Galen Merrick's life. However, this also had the terrible effect of turning many of these already unstable clones insane. The most difficult thing that Darth Vader faced with this is many of the clones were gifted memories from Starkiller Galen Merrick's original past, including his pulls to the light side of the Force. And this is why he ultimately turned to the DNA of Darth Maul. He full well knew that Darth Maul was a savage and a brute, but a loyal one with deep-seated ties to the dark side. Two things that Darth Vader needed within his next Starkiller clone. And it was because of this that he gave the Kaminoan cloners the go-ahead to merge the DNA of Maul and Starkiller into one, deeming it the Maul Killer Project. To Darth Vader's utter shock, at least physically, it resulted in a near-perfect specimen. Maul Killer was born, but there was something strange about him, something terrible. His psyche was there but it had been an imperfect merge of both Maul and Galen Merrick. Instead of inheriting all of the greatest traits of Maul and Galen, he inherited the worst. He was in fact a savage, fueled directly by the dark side of the Force, with the innate incredible physical abilities of Darth Maul and the incredible potential of Galen Merrick. On the surface, he was a perfect apprentice. Below the surface though, was a raging storm. Untamable, savage, lacking all of the greater mysteries of the Force, Darth Vader had succeeded in creating a beast, but not a beast that he could use. Darth Vader noted though, that with time, he believed that he could break Maul Killer. He was unwilling to let this subject go, as he was faster, stronger, and had a greater connection to the dark side than many of the clones. With Darth Vader speculating that he could grow to be more powerful than even the original Galen. In in the end though, Darth Vader's fears came true, as by all accounts, Maul Killer was completely insane. His mind turned to mush by the raging force that was the dark side within him. It was here that Vader finally ordered his execution, sending a legion of clone troopers to do the job. However, even though Maul Killer was subdued and chained down, all of the stormtroopers died at his hand. Darth Vader looked on personally as Maul Killer savaged the entire group, using his bare hands and sheer command over the dark side. However, it was also at this moment that Vader realized all hope was lost. Maul Killer would attack anything, anyone, even Lord Vader himself, and was simply too far gone. In the end, Darth Vader entered the chambers of Maul Killer personally and executed the clone, making sure that Maul Killer was completely unarmed in the process. Following this, Darth Vader would revert back to the normal cloning of Galen Merrick, which would eventually show promising results. However, deep down, he had always desired Maul Killer to be a success. However, he realized that this was something that was impossible. But if you had to describe Starkiller Galen Merrick in a single word, that word would most accurately be weapon. Taken as a young boy by Darth Vader as his secret apprentice, one of Vader's only hopes in overthrowing his master in Darth Sidious, Galen Merrick was trained just to be that a perfect weapon and killing machine to one day be implemented against the Emperor. His latent force potential rivaled some of the greatest masters of the Jedi Order, even Anakin Skywalker. The reason that Galen Merrick excelled so quickly as a destructive force wielder was because this is where he spent all of the time. 
much unlike a Jedi or a Sith even. They focus on the greater mysteries of the Force. The Sith has their ultimate goal to dominate and control the entire galaxy, and they evolved and learned that they could not achieve this goal simply by the gifts of the Force. The Jedi, on the other hand, seek to be enlightened by the Force, to learn its deeper mysteries, and gain a greater understanding of the universe and galaxy that surrounds and binds them together. Galen Merrick, though, has no semblance whatsoever of either of these philosophies. In his heart, Galen Merrick wasn't ever even meant to be a Sith Lord or a Sith Assassin. He was meant to be an atomic bomb of the Force, a weapon to be used and moved around by the Sith Masters that created him and trained him. And this is why he excelled so much. While the Jedi meditated and the Sith attempted to garner power through political means, Galen Merrick focused on destroying he did not need to know the greater mysteries of the Force. This is not the purpose for which he was born. Whenever Galen Merrick attempted to tap into the lighter abilities of the Force, he oftentimes struggled. Abilities that a lowly Jedi Knight could achieve, Galen Merrick had an exceptionally hard time with. Abilities such as Force Heal, or even basic Jedi Meditation. However, the gifts and destructive potential of the Dark Side were literally on the fingertips of Galen. He mastered Force Lightning at an exceptionally young age which is an incredibly powerful force ability. He used all of the pain and aggression, some inflicted on him by Vader, and some even self-inflicted in order to grow his own power, to not only defeat his enemies, but actively obliterate them. And today, we will focus on one dark side ability, a forbidden one, that is incredibly dangerous and that we have only seen Galen Merrick use up until this point. Galen Merrick was so naturally powerful in the dark side of the Force, he had a tendency to combine his very lightsaber and the Force abilities into one, using his lightsabers to channel his own Force Lightning, a Force ability that would be incredibly difficult for even a Sith Master, but came naturally to Galen. Galen Merrick was such a talented prodigy with Force Lightning that he even rivaled the latent power of Darth Sidious. Darth Sidious is slightly the better of Galen Merrick when it comes to the gifts of Force Lightning as he was able to completely disintegrate his enemies. However, Galen Merrick was able to do the exact same thing, and if given time, he absolutely would have surpassed Palpatine with this ability. Palpatine's favorite ability. It is incredibly difficult to use Force Lightning to disintegrate an enemy, with Galen Merrick and Darth Sidious being some of the only individuals capable of such a feat. Force Lightning can kill a subject relatively easily, but to completely disintegrate them was something else entirely. However, even this was not the full potential of Galen Merrick's Force Lightning. Galen Merrick developed his own ability, an ability that only he has ever used, known as Sith Seeker. The description of Sith Seeker goes as follows. Galen Merrick claimed that Sith Seeker was Force Push brought to its absolute dark side limits. It would entail as an inner feeling, using all of their malice, hatred, and contempt for the galaxy as it slowly built within them then channeled directly between his fingertips. Slowly, his fingertips would begin to crackle with force electricity, but unlike most Sith, who would then dispel it into an enemy, Galen Merrick let this build. He let the energy channel directly into his hands, as it would then spread through his arms, as the powers of the dark side of the force that had once been within him were now completely on the exterior, his very body crackling and channeling with dark side energy. But this was not the end. Galen Merrick would then slam his hands together, letting the energy build, but now focusing it between his hands, creating a ball of pure dark side energy. Starkiller noted that not only was this perceived extremely dangerous for anyone in the near vicinity, but he noted that it even caused his very body harm, and if he did not release Sith Seeker at the perfect moment, it very likely could disintegrate even Galen himself. The art of Sith Seeker was essentially taking all of the dark side powers within oneself, and then moving it into a single ball of energy. This would of course leave the practitioner weakened and vulnerable. However, once released, it would channel into a single target, obliterating them completely. If anyone were on the receiving end of Sith Seeker, it would absolutely completely disintegrate their entire body. It should also be noted that again, despite Darth Sidious being a master of Force Lightning, he did not ever use Sith Seeker, although it very likely would have been forbidden even among the Sith, as it posed just as much of a danger to the utilizer of the ability as it did the one that was on the receiving end. Finally, 
Finally, Starkiller would target a single individual and let all of his malice, hatred, and contempt out on that single person. This does not mean though that the environment around Galen Merrick was not also in peril, as even though they were not the direct target of the assault, it would disintegrate enemies that surrounded Galen Merrick. Again though, this power did have significant drawbacks, and Starkiller only ever called upon it in very specific circumstances. Not only did the variability itself injure the practitioner, but it also left them exceedingly vulnerable while they were conjuring the ability as well as afterwards. Enemies could freely fire upon the individual, or if they were a duelist, could even directly attack them, as it required the practitioner's sole attention on this one ability, meaning that if they were to break from it after going, say, halfway through, all of the force potential would be exploded onto the one conjuring the power, most likely killing them instantly or at least gravely injuring them. However, this turned out to be the perfect force power for Starkiller and is considered to be the uppermost greatest of his limits. But I've always found the character of Starkiller hugely intriguing. I know there's a lot of the fanbase that considers him vastly overpowered and vastly uninteresting. However, having grown up with these games and reading various comics as well as the novelizations that went along with the games, I found a great appreciation for the Starkiller character, and I've always been fascinated exactly what made Starkiller, a seemingly average force wielder, so insanely powerful, especially because of the fact that he was able to contend with the likes of Sidious as well as defend beat Darth Vader in both games. Today though, I wanted to focus on dialogue from Darth Sidious from the ending of the first Force Unleashed game, where he says that he is deeply disappointed with Starkiller, stating that he even could have been his successor and considered his equal. You had such promise. You could have been my successor, my equal. But now, but I may still have some small use for you. I still have enemies to find and destroy. You will do my bidding until I find a new apprentice. This has been a line in dialogue that has always stuck with me. Why does Darth Sidious actually think that Starkiller, in terms of power, could be his successor and his equal? And what about Starkiller makes him so massively powerful? This is especially interesting when we analyze the relationship that Sidious has with Vader. At this point in time, Sidious does not consider Vader to be a worthy successor whatsoever, and that is why he continuously tries to foil the attempts of Darth Vader to take power from him. He does not want Anakin Skywalker Darth Vader to sit on the throne of the Sith because he believes that he does not not deserve it. From the moment that Anakin lost to Obi-Wan Kenobi, Sidious full well knew that he would never inherit the Sith Empire. From Sidious's perspective, Darth Vader is too far gone and is now a chess piece to be moved around a board at his whim. But that is why the sudden appearance of Starkiller into the lore shocks Sidious and even allows Sidious to contemplate his future. Perhaps Galen Merrick is that individual that can sit upon and inherit the throne of the Sith that Vader never could. But more importantly, was Darth Sidious being truthful with Galen Merrick in this moment? Well, I believe that there are two options. First though, let's explore exactly why Starkiller is so powerful. Not just powerful though, but able to inherit the title of the Sith Emperor and as a result, the galaxy and empire as a whole. Why did Darth Sidious consider him to be a potentially worthy successor? Well, I believe that it is in fact because at this point in time, it's quite possible that potential wise, Starkiller is close or even outweighs that of Vader. The potential that Anakin Skywalker had is only replicated in the presence of Luke and Leia, and it's clear that by the time of Return of the Jedi, Sidious is eager to replace Lord Vader, as again, he never deemed him worthy of sitting on the throne of the Sith following his defeat. It's clear Starkiller does not have the potential of the Chosen One and Anakin Skywalker, but that doesn't mean what Darth Sidious says doesn't ring true. Even Sidious himself doesn't have a force potential wise anywhere close to what Anakin had in the Chosen One, but it appears as if Starkiller's natural alignment and potential may have actually been equal to that of Darth Sidious's based on this dialogue. He could also mean as equal meaning reign as a Sith, but I believe that Darth Sidious truly here thinks that Starkiller has the potential to become his equal in the Force. And this, coupled with the fact that Starkiller is so young, allows Darth Sidious to contemplate whether or not this could be his new Sith Emperor. If Luke were ever to show any sort of dark side alignment following this though, I do not have any doubt in my mind that Sidious would cast Starkiller aside as well. I also believe that the moment in the first Force Unleashed game, where Darth Sidious witnesses firsthand Galen 
Alan Merrick outsmart and best Darth Vader. He has found himself a worthy apprentice, a potential equal. The following comes from the novelization for the first Force Unleashed game. The apprentice fell back under the rain of blows. The sizzling of fabric and the faint stink of burning skin told him that at least two of Vader's misses had been horribly near, but he felt no pain. He, on the other hand, had definitely struck a nerve. Glancing over Darth Vader's shoulder, he saw the Emperor watching the duel, his face screwed up in malevolent delight, and the apprentice understood a better way to kill, not out of hatred. Whatever lay beneath the black mask, it wasn't beauty or happiness, only ugliness and pain would hide himself away for so long. Hatred would not be enough to turn the tables on Darth Vader. Reaching out with his left hand, he blasted his master with Sith lightning. That broke the momentum of the furious onslaught, enabling him to stand and catch his breath. I do not need hate in order to beat you, he gasped. That's something I will teach you now. Continued, it says this. Anger flared. He lunged forward, his former master barely able to block the blow. A second hit scored a deep wound across his black-clad shoulder. A third stabbed deep into his thigh. Darth Vader reeled backwards, servos whining in his injured limbs and lightsaber shaking. The apprentice gripped his lightsaber in both hands and held himself back. Anger was a familiar and a powerful tool. It also clouded his eyes when he most needed to see clearly. Vader prepared for combat again. His power over the apprentice, however, was now gone. His lightsaber went skidding and sparking across the floor, twisted out of his grip by telekinesis. The force wrenched him into the air as he had once lifted the apprentice's father. A barrage of missiles struck at him with increasing strength. He raised his gloved hand to defend himself, but the battery continued until, with a crash, the apprentice ripped the energy field generator in the center of the room right out of the floor and hurled it at his former master. The generator exploded with great force, as just he had expected, throwing him and everyone else to the floor. The transparisteel dome shattered, debris rained everywhere. The sound of the explosion rang in his ears for an unnaturally long time afterward. He was first to his feet, striding across the rubble where Darth Vader lay face forward, gravely wounded and stripped of his armor in places. Flesh and machinery showed through the gaps. Finally, some real blood was flowing. The apprentice stood over him with his lightsaber upraised and ready to strike. His former master was trying to stand feebly willing his massive bulk to move as it was supposed to. Servo motors whined and strained. When he rolled over, the apprentice froze. This is likely the moment where Sidious realized he could have an equal on his hands, succeeding in the same task that he gave to Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi. But now we must briefly look at another option. What if this was all a game? One final insult to Starkiller who had now completely failed. What if Darth Sidious never intended for Starkiller to truly become his apprentice and the heir to the Empire? And him dangling this lie before him was a final insult. Is it quite possible that just like Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader, he was attempting to insult and manipulate Starkiller? Unfortunately, we will never know Darth Sidious's true thoughts. However, we do know that he did claim, at least out loud, if not internally, that Starkiller could have been his equal. But Greetings travelers and acolytes of a galaxy far, far away, and welcome back to the channel. With Darth Vader making his presence known more on screen with the recent episodes of Kenobi, we have been going back over our research to really try and get a grasp on his true power. In the comics, books, and video games, we know that Vader's power is fear-inducingly strong, with only a very few handful of people that have ever faced and defeated Darth Vader in combat, Star Wars canon and legends included. And a trend that seems to follow this is that all these people who have defeated Darth Vader don't live long enough afterwards to tell the tale, or they usually had lots of help. See our video on the only three people that defeated Darth Vader. However, there is someone who stands alongside Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke who has actually defeated Darth Vader completely while doing so on his own and at the same time nearly bested the Emperor in Force abilities. This person being the one known as Starkiller. Since his debut in the Force Unleashed, he has stapled himself as being a sheer, unrivaled power within the Force, and has completed feats within the Force that we have never seen from any other characters before or since. However, the Dark Chosen One in Lord Vader should have been more than a match for even the likes of Galen Merrick. So for this video, we are going to analyze them both and discover what exactly happened and try to get the answer as to why Darth Vader lost to Starkiller. 
A short time ago, we did a video breaking down exactly why Galen Merrick was so much more powerful than anyone else in Star Wars. For a full explanation, see our video on why Starkiller is so much more powerful than anybody else. But for a quick recap, we uncovered the truth that being not only was he naturally talented in the Force, but because he was trained by Darth Vader directly. In addition to this, it's the way Vader trained him. He was told to never hold back even in the slightest. All Force users, Jedi and Sith, are always taught to hold back in some modicum. Sith usually hold back their power, deciding to keep it hidden, and use it in a large burst so that they can deceive their opponents, luring them into a false sense of confidence before exploiting that and destroying their enemies entirely. Jedi, of course, hold back because they believe that the Force is used to guide and teach rather than to dominate and display power. Galen was taught none of these things, as he wasn't raised to use the Force in either of these philosophies. He was an assassin first and foremost, a brute force of nature within the Force itself. The Force to Galen was another tool in his arsenal, just like his lightsaber and his ship. And just like his lightsaber and ship, he needed his tools to be working at maximum efficiency. Vader made sure that he used 100% of his power 100% of the time. The thing about the Force, and especially the dark side though, is that when you use it like this, inevitably it will grow stronger. Darth Bane referred to it as making yourself attractive to the dark side. This meant bringing about unspeakable acts and using the Force to its full extent so that it flowed through you freely like a geyser with no lid. Any opponent who Galen Merrick came against was to be vanquished quickly and destructively. These principles, though, would come back to bite Vader in the end as we know, when he himself would eventually face Galen Merrick. Galen Merrick also would do horrific things to himself in order to make himself grow stronger in the powers of the dark side. Despite the pain constantly inflicted on him by Vader, he would do self-destructive habits in order to cause himself suffering and pain so that he could make himself a full vessel for the darkness. In one instance, Galen starved himself for days while chained up until he could use the Force to construct his lightsaber in complete darkness. The thing about Galen is he was never a Sith. He was a pure assassin, and not quite an Inquisitor, but more of Vader's own go for. A tool that he used to carry out Vader's own personal agendas and a being far more powerful than an Inquisitor. As of course, Vader only had one, where the Emperor commanded many Inquisitors. Starkiller, though, would end up being brought closer to the light when he began to train with Master Ron Coda in the ways of the Jedi. Master Coda would teach him patience and temperance in the Force, and under his tutelage, Starkiller would perform one of the most mind-blowing feats within the Force, something that fans of Starkiller will know quite well pulling down an entire Imperial Star Destroyer. This was not without its struggles, however, as Galen was unsuccessful in the beginning. Not to mention that the Imperial Star Destroyer was already headed in a downward trajectory. This act, though, mirrored Luke's on Dagobah, as he exasperatedly mentions that it is far too big for him to pull down. Rom Koda echoes Master Yoda and tells him that size doesn't matter and that it is all in his mind. However, unlike Luke who still doubted the gifts of the Force, Starkiller went all in and kept trying until he dominated the massive structure and brought it down to the planet. Despite making the light side of the Force's ally as well, Starkiller continued to utilize the dark side and made sure to unleash all of this power onto Vader when his revenge was at hand. This being a major contributor as to why Starkiller was able to overcome the Dark Lord of the Sith. Like we have mentioned quite a few times before, despite Vader's awesome power in his own right, George Lucas has stated that he is now only 80% of what the Emperor is. You see, midichlorians flow through someone's flesh and blood, so when that flesh and blood is taken away, so are the midichlorians. Midichlorians aren't like cells or germs despite their similarities. The difference is that midichlorians don't grow back. In one's body, if they lose any cells or blood vessels, they will simply be replenished eventually. Midichlorians, however, don't operate like this, and this is why all Force users have a set account of midichlorians that does not change or alter over their life. So, when one loses an entire limb, those midichlorians are lost forever which locks someone in a certain potential cap in the Force. With Vader losing all four of his limbs and being burned inside and out, he was locked into that 80% of the Emperor's limit. Unable to become easily double what Palpatine would have been, the Emperor was born with a naturally high midichlorian count, clocking in somewhere at around 20,000. Just for reference, Yoda hits at around 17,400. So as you can see, Palpatine had no special lineage that we are aware of. He was simply a human born of Naboo, and this ties into directly our argument for Starkiller being so powerful and able to defeat Darth Vader. 
This could actually mean that although very, very rare, it isn't impossible for someone to be born with a massive midichlorian count without a special lineage, and therefore have a crazy amount of force potential. This is where we bring Starkiller back in. It is possible that Starkiller is also incredibly high in his own midichlorian count, which puts him on the same potential level as maybe even the Emperor, or perhaps a level of Grandmaster Yoda. Not to mention, as we've seen before in the past, when someone is heavily enraged, Darth Vader appears to be at his weakest, as he is not able to dominate his opponent's mind and hit them with the wave of fear that he is known for. No matter how skilled Darth Vader is with the lightsaber, undoubtedly far more skilled than Galen Merrick, it is this special moment in time with Starkiller being so fully enraged against his master that allows him to beat him. Similar to Luke in Return of the Jedi, as personally on the channel, in my opinion, Darth Vader is far more powerful than Luke was in Return of the Jedi or Starkiller during The Force Unleashed. It is simply this perfect cocktail of rage, aggression, and power in the dark side that has allowed Starkiller and even Luke to best Vader. On an average day though, I think Vader would have troubles with both of these characters, but ultimately would prevail over them. But is their pure power in the dark side, their embrace of the dark side, that has allowed them to conquer him? the very few times Vader has ever been conquered. With this now squared away, we can now put a solid theory as to why Starkiller was able to best Vader in their final duel. With him having possibly an insane midichlorian count coupled with the fact that he always uses every ounce of his power whenever necessary. And we know that as of the period of Darth Vader, he does not use his power this way, learning his lesson when he was defeated by Obi-Wan on Mustafar. However, of course, had Anakin not been burned and severed, it would have been a completely different story. It is quite possible that he never would have even trained Galen Merrick and would have never needed him. But assuming he had, there would be no way that Starkiller could even match the full potential of the Chosen One. So, students of the Force, what did you think of this? Does this strike you as a satisfying answer as to exactly why Galen Merrick, Starkiller, was able to best Darth Vader in combat? Tell us your thoughts and theories on this in the comments down below. And as always, my friends, may the Force be with you, and I hope that you have a great day. In the original Star Wars trilogy, Luke Skywalker eventually learns his lessons and becomes the ultimate Jedi Knight. Despite everything that his masters were telling him, he conquers Darth Vader but also saves him from the dark side of the Force, in the process allowing him to become Anakin Skywalker one final time before his death. But because of the great power and allure of the dark side of the Force, many of course have wondered what would have happened if Luke Skywalker had embraced the Emperor and Darth Vader. What would have actually happened if Luke had joined joined Vader and Sidious in the dark side, and what would have been the result of his power because of this decision? Just how powerful would Luke Skywalker be if he had embraced the dark side and joined his father as a Sith Lord? The great part about this question is in Star Wars Legends, we actually have an answer to it. To catch you guys up, for those of you that are unfamiliar, the character of Galen Merrick and Starkiller is actually meant and designed to be the anti-Luke Skywalker. The protagonist of the Force Unleashed series is meant to be the this dark side Sith Lord Skywalker. That was the original thought when the inception of the character happened. Starkiller is meant to be a character with the same potential that Luke had. Only Starkiller was someone that was raised and bathed in the dark side of the Force from an extremely early age. The best part about the question, what if Luke Skywalker was raised by Darth Vader, is we actually have an In Legends answer. In an extremely interesting quote, Hayden Blackman, one of the writers of the Force Unleashed series, revealed just their inception and idea for Starkiller, and his relationship to Luke Skywalker as well as that of Darth Vader. The Apprentice is the photo negative of Luke Skywalker. He's been raised by Darth Vader and is what Luke would have become if he had joined his father. Vader is not a very nice daddy. Vader was raised to be a Jedi. When a Jedi uses the Force, they respect it and do not overuse it. The Sith, though, keep testing their limits in the Force. Vader discovers this person who had the potential to be the most powerful Force user ever. Starkiller is up there with the top tier of Force wielders. He's up there with Yoda, Vader himself, Sidious, and even Luke Skywalker. He's extremely powerful. Vader has trained him in such a way that he has kept pushing the 
these limitations, seeing how far he could use the Force. So where a normal Jedi Knight might use the Force to trick his way past a few stormtroopers, the Apprentice might use the Force to bring down an adjacent building on top of said stormtroopers. The Apprentice is extremely confident in everything that he does. He's been trained by Darth Vader to be an assassin an unstoppable force of nature. Something else interesting about the Starkiller Galen Merrick character is that originally he was supposed to be a full-fledged Sith Lord. When the designers of the game brought this idea to George Lucas, George Lucas proposed two Sith names for the Apprentice. Those two names were Darth Icky and Darth Insanius. No joke. For obvious reasons though, the game developers ultimately just chose to go with Galen Merrick. Even Galen Merrick's codename of Starkiller relates back to Luke Skywalker and some twisted way. In the original draft of Star Wars A New Hope, Luke Skywalker's name was Anakin Starkiller. Therefore, bringing back the Starkiller name that was originally Luke's goes back to the idea that Starkiller is the negative Luke. But that was the anti-dark side Luke Skywalker that we actually got to see in Star Wars Legends. It's interesting to explore that the designers between both Force Unleashed games had this idea of creating a Luke Skywalker that had fallen to the dark side of the Force in a completely new character. They wanted wanted to take the powers of Luke and translate that to someone who was in fact fully submerged in the dark side of the Force. And what fans saw was extremely impressive, as Starkiller even today is a fan favorite character among the Star Wars community. The idea of a young Sith Lord or Darksider with ultimate power is extremely intriguing. In Star Wars, most of the time, we get a look at the inside of Jedi culture and what it's like for a Jedi Padawan to grow up within the Order, always tapering their power and learning to control control it. But with Galen Merrick, we got to see what it was like if one of these Jedi or extremely powerful force users didn't do this at all, and instead of learning to fully control their abilities, they simply wanted to push them to their limit. That character was Galen Merrick. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this sort of peek behind the curtain of the character of Galen Merrick slash Starkiller and the idea behind his original creation. What Perhaps one of the most sinister things that the Dark Lord of the Sith, Vader, has ever done is not allowing his failed apprentice, Galen Merrick, to rest. After Galen Merrick's death upon the first Death Star, Darth Vader cloned his apprentice, still hoping that the power of Galen Merrick would be enough for him to one day overthrow his own master, Darth Sidious. Therefore, for years, Darth Vader cloned Galen Merrick again and again, until he was eventually somewhat successful with the clone in Starkiller. Starkiller being the character and clone that we follow over the events of the Force Unleashed 2. Too, a character that's still tortured by the memories of Galen Merrick. Despite, of course, as we learned at the end of that game, him being a clone himself. But Galen Merrick's body was not the only thing that Darth Vader experimented on on Kamino. There were other things that Darth Vader wanted to perfect. Unknown to Vader at the time, though, his two experiments would one day interlocked with one another. And Galen Merrick would get to wield the experimental lightsaber crystals that Darth Vader had been working on for years. As I mentioned, the clones of Galen Merrick were not the only thing that that Darth Vader was experimenting with on Kamino. Darth Vader was also experimenting with a new type of lightsaber crystal known as an impact crystal. An impact crystal was a normal lightsaber crystal by all accounts to begin with. However, Darth Vader had ordered stormtroopers to make machines that literally poured energy into these lightsaber crystals. The goal of Darth Vader was to create a lightsaber crystal more powerful than any other and that would allow him to cut through other lightsabers with ease, as well as grant Darth Vader the power to switch the blade intensity from on and off. In the end though, there were only two lightsaber crystals that Darth Vader was successful with, both of them being yellow in coloration. Darth Vader ultimately decided to name these two lightsaber crystals Impact Crystals. These Impact Crystals were a variation of compressed energy crystals, a compressed energy crystal being a lightsaber type that was very popular among Sith Lord. They created a sort of pulsating lightsaber crystal as it pulsated with power. The power that were within the Impact Crystal though was not light or dark side in origin, it was simply energy. Therefore, why the color produced was yellow and not green, blue, or dark side in nature being red. It had no true allegiance within the Force. The impact crystals were simply pure energy, and as a result of it, also created a blade that pulsed with energy. It is described that the impact lightsaber crystals were far more precise than any lightsaber that Darth Vader had used previously. However, unfortunately, Darth Vader would never get to wield these twin lightsabers in combat, as instead, the rogue clone Starkiller would eventually break free. 
street and come across these two impact lightsaber crystals, ultimately choosing to take them for his own and place them within his lightsabers. This was one of many reasons why Darth Vader would grow to fear the clone of Starkiller, as he himself was unstable in energy and nature within the Force. And along with this untamed energy had two lightsaber crystals that Darth Vader considered to be some of the most powerful crystals in all of Star Wars. The clone of Galen Merrick Starkiller would do a lot of damage with these two lightsaber blades. However, their ultimate fate would be unknown, as Darth Vader did not see them in use when he attacked Starkiller again on Kamino. Meaning, unfortunately for Vader, he would never get to reacquire his impact lightsaber crystals, although he would still seek them out. But that Starkiller is probably one of the most popular EU or Legends continuity characters in all of Star Wars, and for very good reason. He's interesting, motivated, and of course, very powerful. But how powerful is Starkiller exactly? Some fans cite him among the most impressive Force users in all of Star Wars, and others as a rampant, unrefined failed apprentice. So which is it? Welcome to Star Wars Explained, where in today's topic, we will attempt to answer that very question. Of course, over this video, I will not be able to discuss all of Starkiller's powers and feats, but I will touch on some of the big ones. I want to point out that I have grouped both Galen Merrick from the first Force Unleashed game and novel, and Starkiller from the second Force Unleashed game and novel together, as they are genetically identical and their powers are on par with one another. First, we should start from the beginning. The first we encounter Starkiller or Galen was on Kashyyyk, where his father was slain by the hand of Darth Vader. What is fascinating here is before Vader killed Galen's father, he asked him where his master was, as he sent someone far more powerful than the Jedi nearby. Of course, we know following the death of Galen's father, Vader and the rest of us discovered it was actually Galen Vader was initially sensing. Based off of this, even an untrained or minimally trained Galen was shown to have the connection to the Force of at least the typical Jedi Master, particularly in the light side. Not to say that he was as powerful as them at that moment, just that he held a particularly strong connection to the Force. Following these events is probably the biggest thing that has contributed to Starkiller's powers, his years and years of training under Darth Vader. Starkiller took this time to attempt to harness all of his inherent power and become as capable as he could be, and although Vader was not there all the time to personally train him, he did have his training droid proxy and various training programs that helped craft him into an explosive, powerful force user and master of the lightsaber. During this time, Starkiller was also formed into the type of force user he would eventually become. Starkiller never trained to feel peace in the Force, or to learn how to manipulate others and climb the ladder of power. He was trained to be a full-on warrior, and thus became so. His most impressive attributes came from his power over the Force. He was actually only 17 at the time of the first game, and had great control over not only abilities like Force Push, but also more obscure ones like Force Lightning or even Force Repulse. This is almost unheard of in Star Wars, and he used these abilities quite frequently. These powers were no doubt achieved by years of experimentation and practice on his behalf. As a lightsaber duelist, Galen was skilled, but also not the greatest in the universe. I fully believe that without the use of the Force, duelists like Vader would probably be able to eventually take him out. This leads me into my next feat by Galen, that he has not only fought Darth Vader, but defeated him. This is extremely impressive, and to even contend with Vader is something only few have achieved. This being said, there are a few things that contributed to his victory. For one, he was faster than Vader. Like, much faster, and this is something Vader can normally stave off, but it definitely had an effect on the overall fight. There is also a key moment in Galen's first fight with Vader that I think gave him a huge advantage. This occurred when Vader was hit with a reactor that was flung at him, and it appeared to damage the Sith quite a bit. Vader also has a pretty significant weakness to Force Lightning, especially at the time of the first game and book, but he eventually took greater precautions for withstanding the ability, in large part due to Starkiller's prowess with it. This is something that definitely showed through in his duel with the Starkiller clone. Starkiller was absolutely stunning in his final duel with Vader, and I don't want to take anything away from him or this fight. I do want to say, however, that I do not believe he would be capable of defeating Vader every single time. As I stated earlier, it is highly commendable, but also very circumstantial, as are a ton of other lightsaber duels. Despite this, Starkiller is in fact a great duelist and force user, capable of overpowering and killing even council-level Jedi with his dueling skills alone, but the force is where he truly shines bright. Starkiller had huge prowess with physical augmentation, especially when concerning his durability, and although a lot of this can be stocked up to game mechanics and exaggerations, they are still extremely impressive. He survived a crippling lightsaber stab wound and then being exposed to the vacuum of space. He also survived falling from orbit onto a planet with relative ease, 
Suffice to say, he can take huge amounts of absolutely insane and brutal punishment. His skill with object manipulation is also admirable, especially notable when he pulled down a Star Destroyer to a planet from orbit, but it should also be noted when concerning this, it caused him huge strain and the ship was already headed downward. Nonetheless, it is quite impressive. Now we have reached the part of the video I have dreaded, Starkiller's battle with the Emperor. With this, it is extremely important to know the context. Palpatine has always wanted to rid himself of post-suit Vader, always seeking a new apprentice, and as a result, constantly testing Vader. I would compare it to this. Think if a person was promised a brand new Lamborghini, and for years they've always wanted one and worked for it, but when the car eventually arrives, it's a brand new Mustang rather than a Lamborghini. Still a fantastic car, but not the one they have always clamored for. I think this pretty much sums up the way Palpatine views Vader as an apprentice. Great, functional, and powerful, but a shadow of what could have been. The Emperor even says this when he first begins to tempt Starkiller, with the quote, Yes, he was weak, broken, kill him, and you can take your rightful place at my side. Palpatine's fight with Starkiller was a test for the boy, to exploit the true extent of his abilities, and after Palpatine had seen enough and determined he could make a suitable apprentice, he ceased his attack and tempted Starkiller with the option to kill him. I believe Palpatine's goal in tempting Starkiller was to show him he was not truly a Jedi, and that the hatred and anger still flowed through him. I also believe he would have disarmed him if he attempted to strike him down in that moment. This is typical manipulative Palpatine, not only breaking his opponents physically, but crushing their own vision of themselves, and in a way, picking up the pieces and making them what he wants them to be. In the good ending for the first game, after Starkiller refuses the Emperor's offer, Palpatine immediately attacks Ram Coda, and Starkiller attempts to absorb the Emperor's lightning. An attack I do want to point out succeeded in killing Galen. A lot of fans constantly mention that Palpatine says Starkiller could have become his equal, and this is in fact absolutely true. But as I have said in the past, just because someone is capable of something doesn't mean they will ultimately achieve it. Anakin Skywalker was capable of becoming the most powerful force sensitive ever, but this ultimately did not come to fruition. In closing, I want to say this. Starkiller is very powerful, far more powerful than most characters in Star Wars, and capable of holding his own with the likes of Vader and high-ranking council members such as Mace Windu but oftentimes fans over-exaggerate his capabilities and place him higher on the totem pole than he should be. The reason I love Starkiller so much is not because of how powerful he is, but who he is. Starkiller was someone who was placed so deep in the guise of the dark side, but was able to pull himself out. He never chose to become a dark side user, that's just what happened, but he was able to change and learn from his mistakes. The real personality of Galen Merrick shone through, and he pulled himself out of the dirt and into the light. Even though the Dark Apprentice of Vader did some unspeakable things, it was never who he truly was, and I believe Galen Merrick is actually one of the most inherently good Star Wars characters we've ever received. Not only are his abilities notable and hold great magnitude, but his resolve does as well. Far more impressive than defeating Vader or pulling down a Star Destroyer, Galen accomplished what many Star Wars characters cannot, breaking free of the dark side and its addictive and destructive hold, and that is why I remember and love Starkiller and Galen Merrick. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it and want to see more, please leave a like and subscribe. Also, tell me down below how powerful you think Starkiller or Galen Merrick is. May the Force be with you, and have a great day. Starkiller or Galen Merrick has been by far considered one of the most popular Legends characters that we have ever seen in the Star Wars mythos. His ability to as a young boy rival the powers of Darth Vader and Darth Sidious have been hugely compelling. His stance within the light and dark side of the Force is also an aspect that has interested fans ever since he first appeared on our video game screen. He's a character that's massively powerful but massively lost. He's a grenade in the Force, lacking all precision but being extremely powerful and damaging. As we explored in an earlier video, he's exactly what Luke Skywalker would have become if he had been raised by his father, Darth Vader. Because of Galen Merrick's huge popularity within the Star Wars fan base, he actually had plans to make an appearance in Star Wars canon and today we will discuss what would have happened. Ever since the Star Wars show Star Wars Rebels aired, many fans have been asking if Galen Merrick could possibly appear in the series. Because of this fan outcry, Dave Filoni even developed a storyline containing Galen Merrick for the series. He explained though that this version of Galen Merrick would be vastly different from the one that we encountered in the video game. The Rebels depiction of Galen Merrick would not have been as powerful as he was in the game. He also likely would not have been directly apprenticed to Darth Vader as he was in the 
the original Force Unleashed depictions. Still though, we would have seen a character just like Galen Merritt. There were even some rumors that Ezra's ultimate arc in Star Wars Rebels would be to become more like Galen Merritt. However, this ultimately did not come to fruition. Still though, the character of Starkiller was set to appear in the series as an Inquisitor, but not your normal Inquisitor. Apparently, he was meant to be the photocopy of the character of Ezra. Just like in his original games, he was developed to be the anti-Dark Side Luke Skywalker. In the series, he was developed to be the anti-Ezra Bridger. Supposedly, Galen Merrick was going to be an Inquisitor unlike the others in the series. The other Inquisitors were Jedi Knights that had fallen to the dark side of the Force before Order 66 commenced. Galen Merrick, though, was set up to be different. He was set up to be an Inquisitor that fell to the dark side after the rise of the Empire. Just like in the game, apparently Darth Vader was supposed to have seen something special and terrifying within the young boy, therefore allowing him to become a young Inquisitor, and a version of what Ezra would have become if he had trained under a dark side wielder like Darth Maul, and submitted himself fully to the powers of the darkness. Again though, it's highly unlikely that he would have been anywhere near as important as he was in the game. He likely was just set to be a minor Inquisitor and character in the series, someone for Ezra to bounce off of. He was in fact though supposed to be an Inquisitor, someone whose job it was to hunt down all of the remaining Jedi, in the case of Rebels, Kanan, and Ezra. As far as specific storylines though, we know little about what Starkiller was meant to do in the Rebels series. We only know his basic plot and backstory. Unfortunately though, Rebels came to an end and Dave Filoni revealed that he ultimately decided not to include Galen Merrick. The character of Galen Merrick supposedly did not fit neatly into the arcs of the more main characters, thus why he was never included. Still though, the character of Starkiller came very close to being canonized yet again. Anyway guys, leave your thoughts on this in the comments down below, and would you have liked to see Galen Merrick appear in Star Wars Rebel, or do you think it was a wise decision that he didn't? And as a final question, where would you like to see Galen Merrick eventually canonized down the line, if at all?